Moving in the KUM News Zoom room here where we have Gaylene Cruz standing by. Uh, Gaylene penned a viral letter. Um, and I'll just go ahead and read it uh, to you guys before we bring her on here. Half a day. My husband was recently admitted to GRMC with life-threatening conditions. Due to COVID-19, policies have been, been implemented to prevent the virus from spreading. I understand these policies have been made to protect patients and staff from further exposure. One of those policies prevents patients from having visitors, which means they have to fight their battle without a loved one beside them. There needs to be a clear distinction between a caregiver and a visitor. The issue I have with this policy is not that my husband can't have visitors, but the fact that he's unable to have 24-hour assistance from a loved one, a caregiver. My husband has called me crying due to the lack of compassion from the hospital, which discourages him from asking for help. When he was sent to the hospital emergency room by his doctor, he wasn't mentally prepared to fight for his life alone. Poor mental health is a potential risk for chronic physical conditions. I'm seeking assistance to help voice my concern for a change in policy. The change I'm seeking is a policy in which a patient may have a designated caretaker. If that means testing negative for COVID-19 and remaining with a patient 24-7 without being able to leave the hospital, then so be it. If hospital staff is able to come and go with the possibility of being exposed elsewhere, then there has to be a way to allow patients a designated caretaker. We need to rethink this policy and develop a humane policy. We can't allow our sick ones to die alone. It is just inhumane. And we'll bring on now a Gaylene Cruz who wrote that letter that we just shared with you. Gaylene, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me here today. Really appreciate it. Uh, we, we definitely want to get your story out. And let's just um, start at the beginning. Uh, Gaylene, the first question, what's it like? not being able to be by your husband's side as he fights for his life at GRMC? It's really, um, honestly, horrible. A horrible feeling to, to have your husband call every day, crying, begging for help, uh, telling me he's in pain, begging me to come to him. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to keep my emotions tucked in. Um, you know, and his, his greatest fear is he's worrying about dying alone. The patient should be, the last thing the patient should be doing is worrying about being alone. They should be worrying about getting better. So mentally, this is taking a toll on both my family, um, my family, my husband, and I'm pretty sure there are many families out there. And, you know, they need to differentiate between COVID-19 patients and COVID and non-COVID-19 patients. People are so focused on this COVID-19, they forget the non-COVID-19 people who are suffering. So if you don't mind, Chris um, and Sabrina, can I please read um, what my goal is here today, just so that I wrote it down because my emotions, uh, mm -hmm. I don't want my emotions to get ahead of me. I wanna make sure I accomplish my goal yes. here today. If you don't mind, if I can- Yes, kindly, please, uh, please go ahead, Kayleen. I just wanna make it clear that my goal today is here to open the eyes for our governor, lieutenant governor, polit political leaders, hospital executives, and doctor advisory board to open their eyes to the torture and inhumane policies that they are putting families through. It is unnecessary. It is critical that we rethink what, what they are doing and I'm calling for a change in policy to allow caregivers, not visitors, but caregivers to assist their loved ones who are critical illnesses and circumstances. I can talk about all the wrongs that happened to my husband, but I wanna focus on a call for change in policy to have them establish a caregiver policy. If they can put precautionary measures in place for businesses, airports, churches, schools, and then I don't see why it can, it's gonna be difficult for caregivers. Using COVID-19 as an excuse for everything is not cutting it. Today, that seems to be the excuse used to answer every problem and situations. People are quick to say because of COVID-19. You have employees coming in and coming and going, getting exposed everywhere, wherever they go. They come to work, they enter the hospital, they get basic screenings and allowed into, to enter the hospitals. Why can't this be done for caregivers? Caregivers are more likely to be, take extra precautionary measures 
because the last thing they want to do is to get their loved ones sick. Our main focus is to be there to assist and take care of our loved ones. And the last thing on our mind is going anywhere. Thank you. Thanks, Scalene. Have you shared that letter? I mean, have you have you sent it over to GRMC or any of our elected leaders, or is this uh, the first oh, time yes. you've read that? Uh... I gave that letter out to every every uh, senator, mm -hmm. uh, the lieutenant governor, uh, except for the governor. I didn't have her email, but uh, I gave it to GRMC Fran uh, Francis Sa former Senator Francis Santos. Yeah. I gave it to anyone, mm -hmm. all the news, anyone, everyone who would listen about how inhumane this, this policy is. And it's not difficult. In the United States, there are many hospitals that are allowing caregivers, not visitors. I understand, not visitors because of COVID-19, but I think they're being a little over paranoid. You know, the virus has been here since January. It's gonna be here. Are we gonna keep locking our, our, our caregivers out from our loved ones? Are we gonna keep separating them? It's just, Horrible. Have you gotten any sort of a response from any of our elected leaders regarding your letter? Yes, Ms. Tina, uh, uh, Senator Tina Munia Barnes is the first one to call me and reach out to me. Um, there's Will Castro and uh, Terlahi who responded to my emails. Um, Francis Santos called me personally. The Lieutenant Governor has responded to my emails. Um, just basically saying they're going to try to see what they're gonna do. But you know, time is running out for me. My husband has a major surgery on Thursday. That's gonna change his life forever. And I need to be with him. People don't understand. Um, you can have FaceTime, but that doesn't cut it. You know, we're humans. You need to be able to hold your spouse comfort them, especially when they're scared, especially when they got devastating news that's going to change their life forever. There has to be doctors out there for the doctor advisory board who can put their heads together and the senators and everybody have a little compassion. Families should not be going through this. It's unnecessary. How long has he been at GRMC? He's been there since last week, Monday. But my husband was um, in and out of the hospital in April and March. And, um, you know, the second time he went in was March when we had the first lockdown. And we had a devastating, really, really um, hard time. He, he didn't want to go to the hospital. That's the last place he wanted to go. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people out there who are very sickly who just don't want to go to hospital because of this situation and they need care, but they don't want to get care because they don't want to be away from their families. You know, so unfortunately he had to go in. It was directed from his doctor. It was a life um, threatening matter. And so he had no choice. And I tell you, when I, when we went to GRMC, he was crying. He really, really didn't want to go. He said, I'm going to die. That's his words. I'm going to die. So you've been going through this so, for a week now and n nothing yeah. has happened. And, you've been asking to week, be by your husband's side for over a week. Yeah. In a week, he's been through several surgeries already. He's been through a lot during this one week. So much that is going so fast. Put your shoes in the patient. It's going so fast, he's incoherent, doesn't really understand what's going on. Things are just happening, surgery after surgery. Uh, he keeps going in for, now he's on dialysis and, and he's never been through dialysis. So this is a scary thing for him. And so, you know, it's just upsetting that um, when, and when the doctor gave him the devastating news, nobody was there with him. He, when, he, when he called me, I was really surprised, I even, called the hospital asking why are they not calling me and telling me what's going on i'm his wife i had my i had authorization what is going on that you people are telling a patient this by themselves just imagine if, if they told you you had cancer or they told you you have to cut your breasts off or something like that 
imagine that kind of news and then the doctor and nurses leave the room and leave the patient alone. There's so many things that go through your head. You know, that's why there's suicide, high rate of suicidals. There, the people are psychologically having anxieties. People are dying from, from these cases because they're not handling the situation right. You don't just tell somebody, oh, you have a life changing, tell, give them devastating news and then walk out of the room and thinking they're gonna be okay. Having FaceTime is not the same as being there to hold your husband, to comfort them when they're scared because they just got devastating news. And then you're telling him on, on Monday, I asked him, when is the surgery gonna be? Oh, they're not sure because they have to have it consulted with orthopedics or someone else. The next thing you know, that same night, my husband calls crying because they told him his surgery's on Thursday. Nobody called me to tell me, at least tell me first so I can break the news to him. He's distraught. He keeps saying, please don't let me die here alone. Just hear family, your loved one, your husband say, don't let me die here alone. He shouldn't be worrying about dying alone. He should be worrying about getting better. And it's, I don't see, it's not gonna cost the hospital anything to allow me to be there with my husband. In fact, I was, I got a response from the hospital executive uh, cause I was, I was upset and I was a lot, I had a lot of concern. Her response to me was, we are work, we, nurses are working 40 to 60 hours and they are tired and still come to work. She's being defensive. I understand it. I have no problem with nurses. Nurses are greatly appreciated. However, this proves that why we need nurses there. I mean, why we need caregivers there. The nurses are not able to get to my husband on time when he needs the restroom. When he needs it, my husband is bedridden. He cannot move. He cannot because he he has he has um you know like I said to his I, I want to keep it personal because I want to respect my husband but he's bedridden. He can't get up. He can't do anything. So imagine you're laying there. You're helpless. You're you're pressing the buzzer. Nobody's coming for some time because the nurses are overwhelmed. They have so many patients. They're running around back and forth. They have to get patient to patient. Having a caregiver there would ease, would take care, eliminate that problem. If I need to get him a drink, I'll give him a drink. I need to take him to the restroom, take him to the restroom. I need to clean him up, I'll clean him up. You know, whatever it takes, the caregiver's there to eliminate those stresses from the nurses. And you know what they're doing? They're putting patients in diapers just so, because they can't get to them. You know how humiliating that is? You're talking about a grown man who was physically able to do things before. Now it's not. And you put them in pampers. That's humiliating. And they're only doing that because they can't get to the patients on time. If you just have a caregiver there, the caregiver can take him to the bathroom, can help him, get him whatever he needs. I don't understand why the hospital is making patients suffer. They're torturing patients like this. There, you know, doctors and nurses are in the business of helping people get better and see, making sure they see success cases. But in this case, they're not. They're making things worse. They're not being compassionate. And so, and of course, that's why I honestly think that's why a lot of people are dying. And this COVID-19, people are so focused on the people who died from COVID-19. They're not focusing on the non-COVID-19 patients who have died alone. There are many families out there who are experiencing this and it's unnecessary stress. You shouldn't, I mean, it's not hard to designate one person. I've been with my husband for, for 30 some years. My husband has been sick since 2000, going in and out of hospitals every year, all year long. I have been with my husband. I am the only caregiver. I'll tell my three sons, it's okay. I'll take care of him. He's my husband. My husband needs me. I have never left my husband's sight. You know, we made vows and I'm up keeping my vows. No matter what it, it takes, it's just upsetting. 
it's causing stress to the person on the other side of the line, which is me, which is also his three sons crying because we can't be there for him. He's suffering from so much pain. And all of this is going fast for him, like I said, one week. And he's been through so many surgeries. And then now he's being told Thursday is a big surgery. It's going to change his life. He's going to have to learn how to do things on his own in a different way. He's going to see himself in a different way. Imagine that you wake up one day and you're missing a body part. And you have to look at it. He needs me emotionally. He needs me physically. He just needs me to be there. And I don't see why we have to beg the hospitals, our leaders, for something like this. Gaylene, we know uh, at Guam Memorial Hospital, we talked to Lillian that they do make certain allowances for caregivers. I'm not sure why they don't do the same at GRMC. And they allow visitors. Right. Yeah. I, I just want them to understand caregivers are different from visitors. We're not there to visit. We're there to care for them. We're not there to say, hi, how are you, and all that stuff. We're there to care for our, our spouse, our father, or mother, no matter what it is. Patients should not die alone. It's inhumane. And I'm pretty sure all these doctors and lawmakers and everything are in, very intellectual, that they can come up with a policy. If the United States can do it in certain hospitals, I don't see why they can't do it here. Having a caregiver, caregiver there can eliminate a lot for our nurses who are exhausted, like she said, working 46, 60 hours. You know, we, we can help. And if, if, if I have to be in that room locked down with him, I'll, I'll say anyways, that's what I do when I care for him at the hospital. So I'm, I stay in his room and I watch him and I, I tend to him. It's just um, upsetting that they can't can't come up with a caregiver giver policy. And you know, I don't take no for an answer. I don't take this COVID-19 as an excuse. People are so fast to say COVID-19, COVID-19. We get it, we all understand it. We know it, we're practicing, we're wearing masks, we're washing our hands, we're social distancing, we're doing everything that we can. And as caregivers, the last thing I want to do is make my husband sick. So of course I'm gonna take extra precautionary measures. We don't even go to anybody's house for dinner or anything. We don't go anywhere. That's how serious we take this as a family. I have a grandson that lives with us, my husband. I don't, the last thing I want to do is get, get any of them sick. You know, so the only thing that I usually do is I go get groceries. That's the only thing. I pay everything online. I do all my, my errands online. And I always make a list when I go grocery so I can get it one time and don't have to go back. You know, I I don't see what is just so hard for them to see this. Families should not be going through this at all. People should not be dying alone at all. And I'm talking for non-COVID patients. My husband is a non-COVID. He took the test, he's negative. I'm pretty sure if I take the test, I'd be negative because we don't even go anywhere. We don't even do anything. It's Gay just, um, I don't know what to say. Yes. Yeah. Gaylena, we thank you for coming on and having the courage uh, to share your story with us. I mean, every day there's just another heart-wrenching aspect of this pandemic. And you're right, I think we forget that there are many sick people who don't have COVID-19 who are in this similar situation. And I mean, I know GRMC is listening. I know the governor's listening. I know they're all listening. So in closing, what do you want to say to them? I want to say that hospitals are doing more harm than good to the patients. I'm pleading with all governors, the, the governor, lieutenant governor, lawmakers, hospital executive, doctor, advisory board, to please reconsider this policy, distinguish caregiver from a visitor. Let me please be with my husband who's having a major surgery this Thursday that would change his life forever. He needs me, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to be with him. He needs all the support, especially after, after the surgery. 
his life will change. He will need to relearn how to how to do things differently. And he would also look at himself in a different way because of his condition. I'm fighting for my husband. I'm willing to 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 have all if all of you have a drop of compassion, let's not let this virus be become blinders. And I say it again, let not let this virus become blinders. We are people, we deserve better. No one should ever go through this. It's inhumane. No patient should ever be worrying about dying alone. They should be concentrating on getting well. Galen, we're going to bring on uh, Father uh, Paul Goffigan and Father uh, Richard Kidd uh, onto the Zoom with you. Uh, they were standing by. Um, I know we're going to catch up with them on the on the masses, but uh, Father Paul, Fa you. Father Richard, um, is this a, a kind of a situation you guys hear about a lot in the community where we have the people who are sick, whether it's COVID or whether it's not? Um, str I mean, it's not just the patients struggling with the isolation that they're dealing with. It's also their families. What, Father Paul, do you want to say something? <laughs> um, I, I totally, I totally feel for Gaylene and, and her situation. Uh, one of the things that I, I really miss is being present, especially visiting our visitations to the sick. Uh, and, and these are our non-COVID uh, persons. Right now, our protocols state that we can only go and anoint anoint uh, the, the person. But you know, we, pre we as priests always try to reach out, especially to those who are, are bedridden, to those who are homebound. Uh, and at this time, we cannot go because of the situation. Uh, I totally agree with with uh, Galen and in having a policy for caregivers. Because again, we're, we're we're becoming too paranoid. I think uh, I was just thinking the other day we're becoming like monks, in, in, in the sense that you know that show Monk, where mm -hmm. we're just uh, becoming a bunch of uh, germaphobes, and we're forgetting about the humanity and we're forgetting about the, the, the whole the whole healing that, that that someone's presence can give to somebody else it doesn't necessarily have to touch but just to be there just to be present with them especially during their time of, of, of suffering especially during their time of darkness and i i i can you know i'm still reeling from the emotions that are, that, that that are within me just listening to um uh, gaylene's um, Gaining saga with her and her husband and just trying to be there and then like she said it's inhumane to allow someone to die alone and that is really something that we need to think about Polly Richard it was just just uh, Mrs. Cruz we're praying for you and we're praying for your house and for your husband we, thank you so much Father. I, I, I have to admit that um this as you were telling your story i uh i actually was talking with another wife yesterday uh later in the afternoon she was expressing the same frustration uh it was that's exactly what's the issue with her husband but um his his is more dire in the sense that he's actually currently dying and uh you know you you can you you can see the for her it was it, it went from frustration real quick to distraught sad I, she i wouldn't say that she was she was uh, uh you know her one of her or her relatives kept saying you know calm down calm down that everything will be okay but you can only say that so much you know father paul was right <clears throat> and you know listening to you to to your situation and uh, the the individual that I was counseling the other day, the 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 emotions are real and they're very very high. I I mean I can only imagine. I I don't have a family member that is in the hospital right now, so I I, I can't say that I know for sure exactly what you're going through. But but the the stories that I've heard uh, that the you know Chris was trying to get me on weeks uh, last week and then tried to get me on yesterday, but I couldn't because immediately after mass somebody. Said, I, I really need to talk to you. I, I don't know what to do. There's, there's only, there's only so much comfort uh, 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 the medical professionals or scientists can give. Um, 
and there's only so much words of wisdom and, and uh, calming statements and, and peaceful statements from family and friends. Uh, there's only so much that can do. But the physical presence, and the, we, we as priests as well, we, we, we feel that when we're, we're, we're caught between a rock and a hard place when the family members are, can you please come to the hospital? And well, depending on the situation, sometimes we just can't. Um, but I, I can imagine even more with you, with, with your family. And I don't know how many uh, other individuals in your household are also affected by this, by this absence, by the separation. I mean, I, I, I think we can all acknowledge that, that there's, there's, there has been time in, we, you know, in, in, the, in the past. We know when a loved one leaves, for, leaves off island in the, in the military or, or relocates for, for, for job reasons. You know, those, those are, are, are things that you know, we can handle. Well, we'll, we will see them again. Um, and especially when, when they leave and there's, there's no heavy burden on their shoulders. But this, this, is, this is not the same. And, I, and I've heard many people try and equate the two. I said, don't, don't talk about separation of loved ones who are off island to uh, loved ones that are here. They're just down the street in the hospital bed and they physically can get there. So I, I, I've heard many, many a story. You are not, you are not alone in this, most definitely. You definitely are not alone. And, and I'm, I'm sure if others are watching the show today, your, your words brought them some hope. Your, your words, I'm, I'm sure, very sure, have brought them some comfort that uh, somebody is, is speaking out. And, and thank you uh, uh, to KOAM for, for being able to, to air this out for, for further discussion. Um, but in the end, it's the powers that be that will need to make the decision. But this is all we can do with this platform that we have. And of course, with all of us praying that in that all that happens will be for the good and God's will. I, I think and there's, has been so. I think there's a little more Thank that we can do. Uh, Polly Richard, uh, father Paul, if you could just lead us in a, in a prayer for Gaylene and also for just the sick and afflicted on this Island and, and their families, um, as you said, this is not uh, a story that's unheard of. We've heard uh, about these types of situations throughout the pandemic. So if you could, Father. Sure. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty Father, your word tells us in Psalm 23 that even though we walk through the valley of darkness, we will fear no evil because you are there with your rod and your staff that will give us courage. We ask you to look upon us, all of us in this world. We ask you to look upon all the families who are suffering. We ask you to look upon Gailey and her husband and just the very presence that they're not allowed to, you know, to have. We ask you to give them the grace and the courage that to go through this darkness and to know that you are always with there, with them step by step, with them all the way, and to give her husband the courage to know that and to realize, and to know that he is being thought about he is loved by many that we are praying for him for him to recover we ask you to give us your grace that's all we need right now dear lord your grace and your healing and your presence we ask this through christ our lord amen amen Viva Viva Santa Maria Kamalin. Viva. <laughs> Thank you, Gaylene. Again, uh, thank you so much for sharing your story. We prayed over it. And we just uh, put it in God's hands and, and hope for the best with his guidance. Okay, Gaylene? Thank you so much. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you. Of course. Thank uh, you, Fathers. Yeah. Thank you. Fathers, we're going to uh, go to break real quick, and we'll come back with you guys and catch up on the, the weekend masses and what we're looking for uh, this weekend with indoor masses at the church, okay? Okay. We'll be right back. Uh, it's the link.